Hello, I'm Austin McCormick, and you're listening to The Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to discuss doctrine, theology, and the biblical worldview from a covenantal Baptist perspective. We pray that this resource will be edifying to you and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. When studying church history, it doesn't take us long to realize that Charles Haddon Spurgeon is one of the most well-known names in all of evangelicalism. Even amongst Baptists, which Charles Spurgeon was, Charles Spurgeon is well known as the Prince of Preachers. Uh, Many Baptists from all different types of uh, soteriological differences will still quote Charles Spurgeon as one of their favorite people to uh, study or read. If you've been listening to the podcast in the last few weeks, you've noticed that we've been interviewing people uh, to discuss different topics or different doctrines, different theological concepts, and every once in a while I do a podcast episode by myself. So for the next few episodes where I'll be podcasting by myself, we're going to be looking at the life of the man that was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. So let's get into the life of Charles Spurgeon. And a good starting place for the life of Charles Spurgeon would, of course, be his conversion or his testimony. It seems fitting that for the Prince of Preachers, we would talk about uh, how he was born again. But before we can truly discuss his conversion, we must know a few things about his childhood and a few things about his upbringing. Charles Spurgeon was raised in a somewhat Christian environment, Uh, Not the environment that he would come to know doctrinally in his own ministry, but his father and grandfather had been ministers of uh, independent church congregations. Uh, He had early memories as as a child of reading works of The Pilgrim's Progress and Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Pilgrim's Progress is a work by a particular Baptist named John Bunyan that wrote of an allegorical story of Christians described as pilgrims on their journey to a celestial city, which is ultimately heaven. So Charles Spurgeon was uh, influenced with Christianity, but he himself was not a Christian until this day, January 6th of 1850. On this day, January 6th of 1850, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was on his way to church. Uh, He was on his way to a certain church, but because of an extremely fierce snowstorm, he was forced to go to a church that he actually did not intend on attending. And as he was on his way to this church, uh, he found a little chapel, and the name of this chapel was Artillery Street Primitive Methodist Church. And so Spurgeon went to this church service, and during the snowstorm, there were few people there. Uh, there were such few people there that actually the minister of this minis- this Methodist chapel himself was not able to attend. So a layman took the time or took the position of the heralder for that appointed time. And the layman himself uh, was not an educated man. Actually, Spurgeon in his autobiography uh, accounts that this man was really stupid he was obliged to stick for his to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say, Spurgeon says. And so the layman uh, on this snowy day gets in the pulpit and opens up his Bible and goes to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. And the authorized version that he read from look, says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Spurgeon had Christian influences. He probably knew many truths found in the Bible, but he himself was not saved until he heard this sermon. Uh, The minister is quoted to have saying, if it ain't lifting your feet or your finger, it's just a look. And the minister supposedly preached for around 10 minutes and then uh, told them to look to Christ, told them to look to Uh, Jesus who could save them. And so Spurgeon sat under this short sermon. But then the minister supposedly directed his attention directly at Charles Spurgeon and said, uh, 
young man, you look very miserable. And then Spurgeon in his autobiography writes, well, I did, but I had not been accustomed to have been remarks made from the pulpit regarding my personal experience. I can imagine if a preacher personally called me out from the pulpit. But the preacher continued, you'll always be miserable, miserable in life, miserable in death, if you don't obey my text. Young man, look to Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but to look and live. And so Spurgeon recalls, uh, I saw at once the way of salvation, the clock of mercy struck in heaven, the hour and the moment of my emancipation, for the time had come. Spurgeon was raised around preachers. He was raised with uh, works such as Fox Book of Martyrs and the Pilgrim's Progress. He was on his way to church. He read his Bible. He prayed. But he was not converted until he heard the text, Look unto me, and be ye saved. After studying the scriptures for some amount of time, Spurgeon finally came to the conclusion that uh, immersion was the only biblical method and proper form for baptism. So a few months later, he followed through with believer's baptism, and the specific date that he was baptized was May 30th of 1850, which was actually his mother's birthday. And we mentioned earlier that Charles Spurgeon was raised around Christianity, yet he would come to doctrinal conclusions that would differ from his family. Uh, after he was baptized in his autobiography, he would go on to write about his baptism. I knew that my father and my grandfather took little children in their arms, put a few drops of water on their faces, and said they were baptized. But I could not see anything in my Bible about babes being baptized. I learned a little Greek, but I could not discover that the word baptize meant to sprinkle. So I said to myself, They are good men, yet they may be wrong. And though I love and revere them, that is no reason why I should imitate them. And they acknowledged, when they knew of my honest conviction, that it was quite right for me to act according to my conscience. I consider the baptism of an unconscious infant uh, just as foolish as the baptism of a ship or a bell. For there is as much scripture for the one as for the other. Therefore, I left my relations and became what I am today a Baptist so-called, but I hope a great deal more a Christian than a Baptist. So on this day of May 30th, 1850, just a few short months after his conversion, uh, he was baptized by uh, a Baptist missionary, Reverend W.W. W. Cantlow, in the River of Lark. So this is Spurgeon's salvation testimony in his uh obedience and believer's baptism. And uh, what I'd like to do before we close is discuss three areas of application that we can take from whenever we observe the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon's conversion. So the first application point is God's sovereignty over Spurgeon's salvation. Uh, God from eternity past knew uh, exactly whenever Spurgeon would repent and believe because he decreed that it would happen. Uh, God gave Spurgeon the gifts of faith and repentance and knew that Spurgeon would be converted on January 6th of 1850. And uh, not only did God decree that it would happen, he decreed all the means and the things necessary to make it happen. Uh, God actively decreed the snowstorms that would cause Spurgeon to stumble into the primitive, primitive Methodist chapel. God's sovereignty and uh, God's providence brought Charles Spurgeon to this Methodist chapel at this appointed time. Uh, God's sovereignty kept the minister home, and God's sovereignty used the laymen to uh, preach the sermon title, Look Unto Me. So we can observe from the life of Charles Spurgeon that God has decreed when people will get saved, and we can trust in God's sovereignty over salvation. Another area of application that we can draw from Spurgeon's testimony and conversion story is the free offer of the gospel during the preaching of this layman. Uh, the layman, as Spurgeon said, was quite stupid. Uh, 
But he was wise insofar as he preached a salvation message. On a Sunday, a snowy Sunday, the preacher, although uneducated, looked to the scriptures and read the scripture and preached the scripture and told the young man, look unto me. As preachers of the gospel of Christ, we have been commanded to preach to all creation. We have been commanded to tell others to repent and be converted. We have been commanded to tell others to call upon the name of the Lord. And every gospel or every sermon should include some kind of gospel invitation. Every sermon should point to Christ. Every sermon should uh, discuss some form of faith and repentance that leads to salvation because of Christ's work. So if we observe the life of Spurgeon, we see uh, the preacher that preached at him preached the free offer of the gospel during his sermon. And another area of application that we can draw from Charles Spurgeon's testimony is uh, his doctrinal beliefs after his conversion. A scripture should be your absolute soul authority. Sola scriptura and tota scriptura, scriptura. All of scripture and scripture alone. And I promise I'm not taking a shot at any of my pedo baptist friends, but I am looking at the life of a Baptist minister. Whenever it came down to this issue of baptism, he felt it was against his conscience to believe in infant baptism and uh, against scripture, as he says. So whenever we are wrestling with doctrinal truths, we should allow the scriptures to be our sole authority. Whether it is the issue of baptism or justification or election or predestination or anything controversial, anything should be determined by what God has spoken through his holy word. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. If you've enjoyed this resource or you simply like the Covenant Podcast, head on over to our iTunes page, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are also available via Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and Podbean. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.